And thank you for coming to our uh, webinar, uh, ESWL, here now and forever. I'm uh, Efi Shemesh, the sales director for Asia and Africa at uh, Medispec. Uh, before we start, uh, please don't hesitate to ask any question. Uh, please use the group chat and we will answer at the end of the Also, you can raise the, your hand at the end of the session. So uh, let me introduce Dr. Ron Katz. He is the head of urology department in Ziv Medical Center, uh, which is placed in the beautiful north of Israel. Dr. Katz, please go ahead. Thank you, Eti, for the kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Ron Katz, and uh, I'm, for the last six years, I've been here chairing the Department of Urology in the Ziv Medical Center and collaborating with Effie Shemich and the guys from, from Medispec. Prior to that, uh, I worked for more than 20 years in Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, which holds the largest ESWL center in Israel. As you probably all know, stone disease is extremely common worldwide, and particularly in Israel. So we gained experience in more than 30,000 cases during more than 20 years and I will refer to selected cases during my talk. Today, we will talk about the utility and the working with ESWL in general as a technology in the era of combined approaches. We have ESWL and working on one side and developing and the urology on the other side. Is it the end of ESWL? Let me tell you immediately, absolutely not. So the topic of this conversation will be the indications and the usage on the proper usage of ESWL in our era. I will also address specific topics such as ESWL in general in children and in infants, and will also discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the management of stone disease worldwide. Okay. So, how did it all start? In a uh, minute, something I need to change here. Give me for a second. Okay. So, uh, the first uh, reports about ESWL were published by Chris Chelsea in 1984 uh, to 1987. It was a complete shock to the community. Until then, no proper endourological procedures were noted for stone disease, except perhaps retrieving urine stones from the urinary bladder. Otherwise, most cases of, ear, of stone disease were treated by open surgery. And since the patients are recurring and stone disease will not go away, so patients have repeated procedures and repeated surgeries for stone disease. And he came up with this fascinating idea, Dr. Chelsea, that we can crush stones extracorporeally. We see here in the slide, the first model, the HM3 of Dornier, big, heavy, strong, and cumbersome. You only see here the bath itself. It, the whole procedure was done inside a bath with water, heavy water, filled with oil and uh, a lot of salt in them. Something that reminds a little bit the Dead Sea minerals from Israel. And uh, this machine still works in certain parts of the world. I can tell you that I had the, the pleasure and the honor to work with this machine in Hadassah for many years, but this is not the current technology that we are using now. It's efficient, but it's heavy and it's cumbersome. So this is one of the best, uh, I think, current machines available. <laughs> this is obviously a Medispec, which I work with, and I'm very happy with it. Uh, here we do the whole procedure where the patient is in the supine position. He can also lie face down, and we'll discuss this in a minute. And as you probably all know, the shockwaves are being transferred through a gel pad, which is adherent to the patient's body. You don't need to soak the patient in water. You used to do it 
for many years, not in a long time and no more. And the whole procedure, we have the availability of the RFC arm, as you all know, and very high definition screens to locate the stone. And stone localization is extremely important. And this is, again, something that we will discuss in a minute. The most known and challenges in ESWM in general are the patient's weight, the body habitus, and specifically the abdominal region. We can do most of cases. Well, usually ESWM machines in very obese patients are a little bit limited. We cannot contain it with that. Uh, but it means patients usually above 130, 135 kilos. Uh, which is equal to like 270 pounds. And this is quite a lot. Of course, we have obese patients. We have patients with morbid obesity. But the majority of the patients that we treat are not as heavy. If you look at our uh, cohort of 1,000 patients that we do a year in one of the lower living centers, I would say that less than 5% and most and even less, depends on the, the country and the population, are morbid obese. I will tend to tell you already that patients with morbid obesity who are candidates for any stone treatment can benefit a lot from, from a bariatric surgery. And if the treatment for the kidney stone is not urgent, I mean, not like an obstructing stone which needs to be decompressed immediately, then it would be a wise idea to offer the patient for his general health sake to undergo such a bariatric procedure, decrease significantly his weight, and then be treated with extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Thinking that automatically, okay, if a patient is obese, we'll take him immediately to an endourological procedure is not an ideal uh, thing. Because these are the same limitations. If your patient is extremely obese, it's very, more difficult to use the fluoroscopy. It's more difficult to position him, even for an endourological procedure. And it's more difficult to intubate him, sedate him, whatever. So this is one thing. One thing. Now, what about body habitus? Well, the body habitus is important because some patients, extreme with, uh, in some patients, we see that the majority of the kidney lies below the rib cage. This may be a problem because the ribs tend to spread and uh, prevent us from pointing uh, the ESW focus. Our point, the current focus is with a good machine is anything between one centimeter to five millimeters. But if the ribs are on your way, that's an issue. We do have patients also with a significantly dilated colon. It happens once in a while and a deep gutter, meaning that the colon lies almost behind the kidney and surrounds it. The colon is filled with air and that's another limitation. But that's something that we can know in advance and even treat. Sometimes a patient can receive a sleep enema at one day or several hours prior to ESWL, and then his all of his distended abdomen will subside significantly. So these are things that we need to consider just before we cannot do everything. Stone location is very important, and uh, I have and in most of modern machines, you can treat stones almost everywhere. You can treat, obviously, stones in the kidney, and that's still the main advantage of the ESW machines. But you can treat stones in the ureter, either the upper, the middle, and even the lower ureter. For this, you may position the patient, what we can use to call it, face down. Placing the patient face down is not a problem at all, in majority of cases. And if you can turn it depends if you can turn your uh, machine upside down, then the patient can lie on his back anyway. So it's just a point of position. Of positioning. In most of, uh, most of our machines, we can position the patients very well. And actually, we can do ESWL all over the ureter, lower, mid, and upper ureter. Usually, the higher, the easier. And this is all where the endurological procedures tend to fail a little bit or work harder. And I'm not saying anything against embryological procedure, I'm just trying to compare. And again, we'll discuss this in the next slide. Now, 
How do we localize the skill? And this is very important. The classic technique, which everyone uses, of course, is fluoroscopy. And this is meaning radiation. Yeah, we have to remember about radiation and radiation safety that the common stone patient is a recurrent stone former. If you have one episode of stone, you have a chance of between 10 to 12 percent per year for another episode. And these episodes need to be evaluated and often treated. The patients need something. And if you expose patients, recurrent patients, who start developing stones in an early age, let's say he, her, they're early 20, for example, by the, the late 40s, and you know, early 50s, they will be exposed to a huge amount of irradiation, which is easily above the allowed, the allowed standard in most Western countries. And we'll talk soon also about the impact of radiation in pediatric cases, where they have 60, 70 more years to go of possible stone treatments. So we use fluoroscopy. And the fluoroscopy is good if your stone, as you can see here, is extremely radio opaque and easily visualized. Endurological procedures use the same technique. They use fluoroscopy and a lot of fluoroscopy. This fluoroscopy endangers not only the patient, but in the long run, also the surgeons. So most of the embryological surgeons will use fluoroscopy in their procedures. I can tell you that there is a mild trend. Uh, we're actually doing a, a study about this right now and submitted this for publication about fluoroless embryology. No fluoroscopy. And the majority of the embryological community is against it. People are reluctant to hear, what? Are you doing any retroscopy, even for a small urethral stone without fluoroscopy? This is irresponsible. Okay, so keep exposing your patients to radiation. But if you talk about ESWL, this can be done easily and accurately with the use of an ultrasound. You have to be familiar with the technique. See here a nice example of a, uh, this is a, a ureteral stone, radio opac, you use fluoroscopy. Okay, how much fluoroscopy? But here you see examples of a stone Radiolucent, which is demonstrated in the renal pelvis and in one of the calluses by retrograde pielography. That's an invasive procedure. You inject contrast material to the ureter and to the kidney, and you can see the stone as a feeling defect. But why do you need all that when you can see them very safely with simple ultrasound? And this can be done with the ESWL machine. So, Positioning and localizing a stone for, ES, uh, for ESWL is feasible with an ultrasound with zero radiation. I can tell you that we use it here in my service and we're very happy with that. I'm not saying that we need to use one mode or one modality for all cases. But once you get used to using ultrasound, especially for kidney and after ureteral stones, which is the majority of cases referred for ESWL anyway, the amount of irradiation that you use, the amount of radiation exposure to your patients and to your staff decreases significantly. And this can be done very easily with ESWL machine. Now, what about crushing of the stones? Um, our goal is to crush the stone to as minimal particles as possible. We want the patient to expel them with as minimal pain as possible. That is good. We can do and crush stones to small particles, which are one to three millimeter of fragments, and also to dust. Let me tell you one important thing. Lasers do the same. The most popular lasers crush stones embryologically to the same size, one to three millimeters. Another issue is that if you break a stone, if you break a stone during an embryology session, you use a water flow. For your visibility. And often, the smaller the particles become, they've just been washed away from you. So, people will tell you, and this is correct, that you can crush stones to very small sizes with laser beams, but they do not necessarily stay when you want them to stay. So, you take a seven millimeter stone and you break it, break it into two or three fragments of two or three millimeters, and they'll be, then they'll be washed away sometimes pushed back to the kidney, 
and the patient will have to expel them spontaneously later all the way from the TV along the ureter. But if you crush them very well, inside you, inside you, with an ESW machine, they will not go anywhere, just usually down the road. Uh, you have probably heard of, and if not, then let me pay your attention to the new lasers, uh, the new homium lasers, yeah, which work in the dusting technology. Dusting technology is a fine technology where the rate of stone breaking with the laser, laser beam is extremely, extremely fast. It breaks the stones into minimal particles and turns them hopefully into dust. But these are good lasers. I'm not saying anything against them. Don't misunderstand me. But you need to know how to do it. You need to have it. Not everyone has a dusting laser. And that's, that's an issue. And even with that, you cannot dust everything. Most of those new lasers, such as lasers by Luminis and Dornier, have a dusting capability which you don't always use. And there are several modes of dusting. You need to know how to do it. With proper dusting technique, you can probably break stones slowly, slowly, into very small particles. But again, they may be washed away by the water flow. Due to an ESWL machine, you can break stones to the same size, and usually they would not go anywhere. They could just go down the road. Now let's talk about some of the main principles of proper stone breaking. And this is something I would like to emphasize, and also when I'll summarize, I'll refer to that again. Many physicians tend to look at ESWL machines as a washing, as a washing machine. Deep water, sorry. <laughs> they think you just place your patient in the machine, you press enter, and it will do something. And this, of course, absolutely not true. It's a delicate technique, and you need to know the pros, cons, and the small tips and tricks of the technology. So usually we use a uh, voltage of 25 kilovolts. The number of shockwaves traditionally is between 1,500 to 3,000. You don't go over 3,000. Usually you do not need it. And if you go over it, usually you get a blur from the stone that tends to break. There's no point. But as I said, the main reason that we are not going over is that we don't need it. Most of our machines break the stone very efficiently in more, not more than 2,000 shock waves. The rate is important. Rates around 60 per minute, per minute are accepted and they're probably most efficient. Slower rates can work. Faster rates than 60 are not that efficient and it takes time for the stone to absorb the shock and throw it backwards. That is, if you try to crush a stone in 120 per, se, per minute rate in order to finish early and go home, you'll probably do a bad job. The stone needs to absorb the shock. What does it mean from the practical point of view? As I say here, that uh, for 1,500, you need about 25 minutes. So 25 minutes for little trips is not a long time. And uh, even if you compare it to an endurological procedure, that it will never take them 25 minutes. You need to prep the patient, you need to position him, you need to either intubate him or do a spinal anesthesia. And if you look at the whole thing, then uh, let's say that uh, uh, endurological procedure, like the arthroscopy for an upper ureteral stone, let's say, will take about an hour. On the contrary, if you take an ESW session for the same stone, which will require probably 1,500 shock waves, then you will take 25 minutes for the procedure and probably less than 10 minutes for the additional procedure because all you do is place the patient, locate the stone, experienced technician or physician can do it in two minutes and the patient receives either anesthesia or often deep sedation and this also takes only five minutes. So all in all, it's usually a shorter procedure even if you work in a rate of 60 per minute. Um, dual mode lithotripsy is possible. Uh, it's not as efficient. Again, it's, there's not a big advantage in going faster. And so dual modes meaning that shockwaves come from either two, point, two, uh, two uh, positions and meet in the way. I don't think there's a real much benefit 
So the traditional 60, uh, 60 per minute rate of shockwave is great. Again, each, uh, each patient is unique, each case is unique, and everyone can do whatever they do. Uh, take also the consideration whether you're working in a synchronous or unsynchronized mode with the heart rate. Usually if you work around 60, it's very easy to work synchronized and it's safer for the patient. Uh, healthy patients, young patients, slender with small stones can be treated with an unsynchronized mode under supervision and this sometimes can go a little bit faster. Now, what about the stone composition? Uh, we know that the, the harder the stone, the, the harder it is to break it. So a patient with cysteine stones these stones are extremely hard and more difficult to break, but everything is breakable with an ESWO machine. It may take more time and mainly more patience, especially from our crew, but it's all feasible. All in all, the triple D score is a combined score of the feasibility of the ESWO and or no general stone management. It takes into consideration the three uh, Ds, the distance from the skin, if your patient is very obese or the kidney is very deep and you have more than 30 to 15 centimeters from skin, well, it gets more difficult to do an ESWL session. Again, positioning is important and the patient weight, of course. Uh, the next thing is the dimension. I'm sorry, I skipped the D here. Apologies. The dimension uh, of the stone. And the last thing is the density. We measure today the density of the stones with the Hounsfield units. Most patients will be evaluated by a non-contrast CT scan. And if the patient has less than 700 pounds to units count for a stone, it means that it is easily breakable. Now, I can tell you from my experience that most of the patients, especially with single upper ureteral or kidney stones, will be around 550, 600. And these things are readily and easily breakable with the DNSWL machine. Uh, so I don't see any need or any justification to do an invasive procedure and go in with a ureteral scope, go through the ureter, meet the stone, and crush it with a strong laser, so-called, where you can do a great job at the whole form. Uh, here's one of the first cases I treated more than 20 years ago. Would you do this with an ESWO machine, or is it feasible? So we won't vote on it, but I guess that most people will tell you, and they will be absolutely right, that this thing will not be done by the ESW machine. And there's a reason for that. There's a high stone bottom here. This is a complete staghorn stone. But believe it or not, I did it with ESW. There's a technique how to do it. I'm not saying that you should do it. I agree, and all the guidelines agree, that high bottom stones need to be treated with percutaneous natural lithotripsy. P, C, and L. But, but if you don't have P, C, and L available, or if you like, you can crush such a stone with four separate sessions gradually and let the patient expel the stone. So everything is crushable. I'm not saying that you're not you're going to do it with an ESWL machine, but we take into the consideration that if you want, it is possible. Now, Here's another case that we saw earlier before. This is a 24-year-old male, thin, otherwise healthy. The stone is calcified. It's located in the upper part of the ureter. There's an easy access for shockwave lipidation. Is there a benefit for him doing ureteroscopy? Now, the answer is no. For such a stone, easily accessed, easily visible, thin, young, healthy patient, the stone free rate between ESWL and ureteroscopy is the same. It is true that for one single, one session, the one session stone free rate is a little bit higher in ureteroscopy. And this, uh, this is why many patients, uh, many physicians say, let's do ureteroscopy in this case. I mean, I want to get it over with. In a single session, I want to clean the patient. It's okay, but as you can see here, there's a high rate of complication. And the urological procedures are invasive. There are many invasive, but invasive. You need to go through the ureter. You need to dilate it sometimes. You may injure the ureter with your passage of the scope or with your lasers. If you're trying to extract large fragments of stones, 
you may damage the ureter on the way. Okay? Now, if you go in and out to the urethra, and this is a male patient, you go in and out, the patient has a slightly increased risk of urethral stricture due to repeated endurological procedures. Again, I'm not saying that endurological procedures are not good and they're absolutely efficient, but there's a higher rate of complication and this tendency to do one session and that's it is not always justified because we know quite well that patients who expel stone particles spontaneously are never damaged. They can be obstructed, they can suffer from an infection, but if you take a sterile patient who's doing an extra corporal shockwave lithotripsy, he will probably not have an infection. But if you take a sterile patient and place in a scope that goes from outside to inside, up to 30% of patients may end up with an infected urine. And this is one of the, uh, one of the major complications of endurological procedures. So, what do we have here? We have the possibility to end it in one session. Patients are very happy to do the case and you'll be stone free versus the possibility of getting complications. Now, many of my patients come and tell me, you know, I, I want to get over with. It always happens before they need to go to vacation. Now, with the coronavirus, we're not going anywhere. So, that's another relief. But often patients will come, next week I have a flight somewhere. What do we do? So we want to get it over with. Let's say, let's do an endurotheroscopy, but this is not true because patients may suffer from complication which will keep them or bring them back to the hospital. I'm not saying that ESW is a field of complication, but obviously, and then to summarize, the one session stone free rate is slightly high in urotheroscopy, but so is the complication rate. And that's something that we need to remember. Just a minute. So, and this is also, this is guidance, the European Guidelines on Interventional Treatment for Neurodialysis, published in 2016. Summarize and emphasize this exactly. You may end up with the stone easier, but you'll get more complications. So here's another case, classic. There's another patient of mine, 48 year old, female, healthy, a 12 millimeter lower calcium stone. She has intermittent pain because the stone once in a while jumps up and obstructs the ureteral pelvic junction up here. On non-contrast CT, the stone composition is about, we don't know the composition, but the stone density is 550 pounds per unit. The patient has a normal body habitus, normal anatomy, she's not too thin, she's not too fat, too fat. Now, if you want to do it in an endurological procedure, you have to do a real that means go up from the ureter, go all along up here, and go down, flex down with your device into the lower callus to meet the stone and break it with the laser. If you cannot just pull out the stone, it's too big, it's 12 millimeters, it will never go away through, it will never pass through the ureter. So you have to crush it with the laser. Sounds reasonable, but why is it justified? We can easily access a lower pole stone. And as I said, in such case, normal body habitus, lower calcium stone, we can do it under the guidance of ultrasound. And I can tell that I'm doing it here in my, in my practice more and more. We hardly use fluoroscopy in such cases. There's no indication. And again, let me refer to the, you know, to the current guidelines. Here, the 2016 uh, European guidelines, a 10 to 20 millimeter stone of the lower pole with no unfavorable ASWL factors, meaning that the patient has normal body habitus and the stone is easily identified by, uh, by our fluoroscopy or as I prefer, the ultrasound devices, can be treated equally by ESWL or endurology. And I prefer uh, as well for that. I think it's highly justified. There's no indication to risk the patient's ureter with passages, recurrent passages, through the ureter in order to treat a lower calyx cell stone. And this treatment as I, uh, should be discussed as an option with all patients. And this is uh, here as published by the Cyrus in 2017. Now, let's talk about pediatric cases. This is very important. You know that pediatric cases are not rare. As I said, I practice here in Israel. Israel has a very high stone disease rate, 
compared to worldwide, also in children. And the north of Israel, where I practice now, is the region with the highest rate of stone disease. So we get a lot of experience with pediatric cases as well. Now, children are unique. Most of them are thinner, which makes ESWM easier. We know from experience that children pass stones through the ureter easier than adults. And it's also easier for them to expel the stone out. It means that if we crush a stone extracorporeally very easily, then it will be easier for them to pass stone particles and dust out without the need for stamping compared to adults. And as I, as I said again, they're healthy, they're young, they're usually thinner than adults, so it's very easy to do ESWL for the pediatric patient. So let's look at the literature and see, let I summarize here a recommendation for two leading articles from uh, 2019. The first one for the general pediatric urology, the extracorporeal shockwave receptivity versus ureteroscopy in the upper, in upper urinary tract stones. And what they, what they found is that they were equally effective. There was less pain and less operate in emergency room admissions and less urinary tract infection and less usage of anesthetic devices, uh, anesthet anest sorry, anesthetic materials during SWL sessions, as we mentioned before. Why less pain? Because you crush the stones very easily. Less need to return to the emergency room because you don't have pain. Less urinary tract infection is extremely important when you do an invasive procedure for children and adults there's a significant risk of urinary tract infection with all the sterilization techniques that you use and prophylactic antibiotics. You get more infection. Why? This is absolutely not justified. Okay? And less anesthetics, that's simple. We can do it in deep sedation. We don't need to put them asleep. And this is a, a extremely important again. And there's the same clinical efficacy. Another article published in the BNC Urology which is the best treatment for pediatric upper urinary tract stones. Comparison of extracorporeal, percutaneous nephrotomy, and real retrograde in uh, intravenous surgery, as we discussed before. What they found when they compared Ed is that the lower, the, the, sorry, the stone free rate for S12 was a little bit lower compared to endourology. We discussed it before. So if your single session stone free rate is a little bit lower, okay. But you can do another session if you like. It's not such a big deal. So what happens if you do endurology? It works. A single session stone free rate is better, but there's a longer OR time and longer and much more radiation radiation exposure for your retroscopy. And that's something that, for, in my opinion, especially for children and pediatric cases, is unacceptable. I'm not, okay. I don't see why putting children to sleep for longer periods of time and expose them to more radiation just to get a single session stone free rate. I prefer to do an S well session, and if I say a stone is stuck and we have no choice, then we can go for endurology. But if we, if we do an S well session and it works well, we all gain from that. And a second ESW session is always an option. Here's another very important issue. We just discussed pediatric urology cases, but what is pediatrics anyway? According to the law, pediatric cases are cases below 18. In all series of pediatric endourology, you see patients age 14, 15, and even 17. These are practically adults. Okay, there's some that are thinner, some that weigh a little bit more, a bit less, sorry. But these are practically adults. I mean, the minute you turn 18, you become an adult. Two days earlier, you're in, in your pediatric case. Most of my pediatric cases, according to this definition, weigh about 75 kilos. Okay? But let's go specifically to infant ESWL. Now, this uh, picture taken, was taken many years ago in Hadassah and Karen Hospital, where I worked 20 years. I said the leading ESWL uh, center in Israel. And this is Aryeh. Our mythological technician, he still works there and is responsible for more than 30,000 cases. This is the old machine of the HM3 that they had. 
They're not using it anymore. Be sure of that. But what I would like to emphasize is this kid. This is a two-year-old kid. And we have patients with two and three-year-old with stones. And we need to break them. Now, that's very difficult to do endourology in a two-year-old. You can go into the bladder, sometimes to retrieve something it's feasible. Going into the ureter is a very difficult issue, requires specific delicate instruments we are, which are not readily available. And if you damage a very fine ureter of a child, this is a lifelong gift that no one wants. They'll have to undergo the implantation of the ureter, repeated endourological procedures to open up strictures, and that's something that we absolutely do not want. As I said, on the contrary, children expel spontaneously strong particles very well. So if you crush them with extra hope or shockwave lithotripsy, take into consideration and be certain that without the need of additional scenting or additional procedures, most children, most infants, two, three-year-olds, can be can be driven to the state of stone free with simple ESW session and again with minimal if no radiation. So we cannot uh, we cannot uh, avoid and overlook the uh, pandemic that we're experiencing right now. The COVID-19 is spreading worldwide and this has a significant impact on our profession. What do we do? How do we treat patients? How do you treat patients in general? How do you treat patients if we know that they are positive for COVID-19? Do we need to take the risk? Or can we choose? So here's a systemic review recently published in the recommendation for the urological standard of care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's start with a few facts. COVID-19 is detected in the urine. It was not cultured from the urine, okay? And most of the laboratories would not do a, a viral culture, but rather a viral PCR test, means they're locating and they're confirming that the virus is there. We're not sure whether it lives there. But obviously, COVID-19 was detected in the urine of patients. So patients who suffer from the coronavirus may spread it through the urine possibly. I would just say that we are not aware of any case that someone was infected through urine contact. It may happen, I'm not aware of the case. I looked at the literature again, spoke to my colleagues, but no one wants to be the first case, okay? There's a worldwide recommendation to take extra caution with the usage of procedures that cause other aerosol or splashes. Aerosols tend to happen during laparoscopy, where we open up to a card and gas flows out of the patient's abdomen into the operating room, and this is something that, of course, we cannot allow anymore, obviously not in the COVID-19 era, and splashes of water or irrigation fluid, which are very common in the urological procedure. Of course, you have to protect yourself. You have to cover your face, you have to cover your, your eyes, but still there is a risk of splashing. So do we need to do endourological procedures for patients in this era? What most authorities would agree, first, that non-urgent cases can be postponed. That is, if you have a patient who's not highly symptomatic, recently diagnosed with a lower calicell stone, and they would like to return for retrograde intra-renal surgery, RIRS, okay, uh, done with endurological devices, it can be postponed. You know, they're absolutely right. You can postpone the treatment for lower, lower cold stone for six months. No harm will be done properly. If you have an urgent case of an obstructed kidney with urosepsis, of course, you have to drain it. But again, you have to drain it. doesn't mean that you have to go all the way and work throughout the laser. Could be, is WLB justified in such an instance? It's a very interesting question, and there is no answer. Do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that ESW is better, but you have to think about it. If you'd like to treat an upper ureteral stone, which causes pain and intermediate obstruction to the kidney, and you want to treat it as less invasive as possible in order to avoid exposure to irrigation fluid splashes that may jump from the patient to your eyes, although you take all the precautions, 
Then why do you do a thoroscopy? Do an ESWL, totally extra folklore. Do not expose yourself to any fluids and let the patient expel the particles by himself. What I'm saying is my opinion. I think that it's logical, I think it's reasonable. I do not have any data to support it because to the best of my knowledge, no trial was done. But if you take into consideration the general recommendations worldwide for physicians' safety during minimally invasive procedures, such as laparoscopy and mainly urological endoscopy, I think that it would be worthwhile to consider the use of a totally extra corporal uh, approach instead of intracorporal endoeurological procedure for treating selective tissue. So, in summary, I would say that, as I'm sure you all, you're all convinced, and I'm absolutely convinced, extracorporal shockwave lithotripsy is reliable and efficient. As I said before, it's not a dishwasher. You do not place a patient in the ESWL machine and let it work. It's an accurate technology, it requires knowledge, and it requires experience. When you do it accurately, accurately the stone free rate of ESWL and endoeurological procedures is almost identical. There's a lower rate of complication during ESWL sessions, and there's a significant less usage of irradiation. I believe, strongly believe, that ESWL is better for children and mainly for infants. The treatment of any case should be optimized. You have to take into consideration the stone bottom, the stone location, the urinary tract anatomy, the patient's body habitus, and previous treatment that he had. Under this consideration, I think that ESWL is highly effective and it is here to stay. So I'd like to thank you very much first for the invitation to talk to you and for your, uh, joining me here today. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Avner, you are on mute. I will read for you some of the questions that you raise, people raise uh, on the chat. They say, can you tell us about side effects due to ESWL? Well, yes. Well, what are the side effects? Well, if you use high energy, you may see a day or two after a session, some hematomas in the flank region. Uh, they, can, they disappear spontaneously, of course, and usually no harm is done with them. Uh, we know that in high energy ESWL, if you do uh, a non contour CT or even an MRI, we don't use the MRI because we don't see the stone, but it was done for, uh, yes, for research purposes, you may see some subcapsular hematomas in up to 2 to 3% of the patients. They are asymptomatic and usually do not require any treatment. Uh, one thing about flank hematomas, flank hematomas tend to develop when patient is not sometimes well sedated and you move them too much. And this means that you're a little bit out of focus. The minute your patient is well positioned, even if you use high energy, you will see less hematomas. And as I said, uh, this is not a big issue anyway, because it's not clinically significant. You would see some bloody urine, which is normal, and patients will expel stones and particles. Again, there's no harm in that. Take into consideration a special caution two things. One, patient's blood pressure. A patient with unbalanced hypertension should not be treated with ESWL. Should not be treated anyway. Should be, high blood pressure should be well balanced. We know that highly excessive high blood pressure, I'm not saying about patients with hypertension which take their medication, but unbalanced patients with high blood pressure of about, about 180, for example, may bleed more after ESWL session. If you bring a patient to ESWL session and on the table 
get a spike in high blood pressure that cannot be controlled, do not do the session. Another thing is the use of uh, any blood dilutants and uh, any anti androgen therapy, such as aspirin, Flavix, whatever. There's a sparse and wide range of uh, compounds used today. The most common, at least in Israel, are, of course, aspirin, Eliquis, some patients are still on Cumadine for heart disturbances. Of course, you do not do a case, also not an aspirin. You can do endurological procedure sometimes on aspirin. It's up to the surgeon to decide. But ESW should not be done because you may risk a, a retroperitoneal hematoma from that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I can say that bleeding from the kidney in the earlier stage, in the beginning of the 90s, it was been some kind of a symbol that at that time still people give in, in infusion during their treatment and have a catheter. So when you saw the blood flow from the catheter, say, okay, we are in the kidney, we do the work. But definitely since then, a lot of things was changed and, and, and uh, I think we are in, in a different place today. Uh, 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 one another question is: Can we use ES, uh, ESWL effectively for stone at all level of the ureter? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, the answer is yes. Um, uh, I absolutely agree. There's more than one option, especially for the distal ureter, which is usually easily accessible. So, but you can use ESWL all the way. It's just a matter of positioning. Now. Sometimes, if you use, if you go for ESW in the lower ureter, uh, you have either to place, place the patient face down on his abdomen, sometimes, and sometimes the standard bowel may be on your way. But it is possible. I, I did ESW from all the way up to all the way down. It is feasible. It's just a matter of localization. Uh, if you cannot do a case, if you cannot see the, uh, the stone well, then no, you don't have to force it. You have to tailor the treatment to the patient. Uh, yes, that's uh, correct. And again, it seems that you need to think all the time between those things. Uh, another question that's related to the big question, what to use, laser or a, 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 or a lithotripsy, and a lot of doctors have objective regarding that. They say that laser is faster and more efficient. Well, well, as I just mentioned, as I just mentioned, lasers are efficient, but they're absolutely not faster. But if you measure the laser itself and you use a dusting laser, yeah, it works fast. Of course, it works fast. But if you take the procedure itself, in general, it's not faster. Because if you want to do your arthroscopy for, let's say, a 10 millimeter stone in the upper ureter, which is easily identified and visible. So you can break it with, like, say, 2,000 shockwaves, and it will take you about 30 minutes, okay? More of that. If you take, as I said, take, give or take more than 10 minutes to prep the patient. That's all. All, all you need to do is place him on his back, okay? Give him some sedation, position the stone, and let's get to work. And that's it. You don't have anything else to do. From my experience, and we do, of course, end neurological procedures, if you want to go for the same thing with a ureteroscope, it will take you about an hour and an hour and a half because you need to, 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 the patient needs to be either asleep or have a regional anesthesia and it, it takes time. Then you position him, then you bring the external CR with your technician, then you prep the patient, then you go in, and then you work with the laser. The laser itself may be faster, but the procedure itself, the procedure is longer. And I, I want to say another thing that's related to this, that's not only it's longer, usually it's start to, to consider a risk factor when you do a full anesthesia over than one hour, you increase dramatically your risk factor. And usually most of the laser procedure, it's more than one hour full anesthesia. So actually we increase dramatically the risk factor and sometimes even those laser procedure could become two hours and three hours and then it's a issue to consider that uh, to look for this aspect. And uh, obviously, uh, and part of the issue of this, and I agree with you, uh, Professor Katz, that many times when I compare the result from different uh, users in the world, 
I see a big difference of the success rate with the lithotripsy. And that's exactly because the reason what you stay, if you don't take the right patient, if you don't treat the patient properly before the procedure, because the efficacy of lithotripsy increased dramatically when it's underwater surrounding. And, uh, and that's, I saw it at least one time, uh, one doctor told me that you have uh, uh, something like 40, 30% success rate. And uh, I asked him uh, what is his procedure? And uh, he said, we don't give people to drink for 24 hours and thus full, full fast and, and then they go to the treatment. So I told him, give him one liter infusing before the treatment and next time that I met him, he say, I increased my success rate to more than 80%. So definitely those small things that you need to do to do it accurate, to remember it's a, if you don't do it accurate, not checking the alignment, not position the patient, not see if it's moving or not. And we need to remember that say, especially if we don't use a full sedation, one of the advantage of lithotripsy, patients are moving. And if you start to look, for example, after a 600 shock or 1000 shocks, or maybe most of the time we move in the beginning and you're missing, and especially if you're using a, only some kind of small anesthesia or epidural, one of the things that you need to do is to train the patient to breathe properly that is not moving the stone too much from the location. All those small things of technician make the difference to make a much higher success rate uh, from a, a, a what you do and then it could bring you to the level of 80 and 90% in the right cases of success rate in lithotripsy and if you do it not uh, accurate and not taking all those things, then it start to go down and down. And that's what give the, uh, sometimes the issue that say, the success rate with uh, uh, lithotripsy is much, much less than the high rate success of endourology. But when you do it properly and you choose the right stone, that's definitely you can reach nearly the same and the other benefit related to this, they are uh, very high. And I want to tell a little bit story in one in the AUA meeting, it was survey with the uh, American doctor, how you treat certain type of stone between uh, uh, endourology or lithotripsy. And they say, we want you to split it to three different types of a patient. One, a general patient, one, a family member, and the third one is yourself. And the answer was being very unique in this point. They say, if it will be a family, it's very clear, he will go under endourology procedure. And uh, if it's a, a patient, we will explain them the benefit, what to choose, and, and uh, according to their decision, uh, they will go. And if it's us as a physician, most of the cases we will prefer to go first a lithotripsy, and worst case, we all the time could do a, 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 a endoology. And the most important part is the explanation why they have this selection. So this selection comes from very simple is a issue. If it's a family member, they say we can't allow to say that they will say in the family that we are bad doctor, we doesn't break the stone. So stone free is the most important. Complication, it's part of the procedure. With this, they can live. And if it's a, a, for the doctor, they say, due to the level of complication, we prefer most of the time to go to SWL. This is more important than to do a two, a, a two procedure in the worst case. And, and I, I think this is in some way summarize the spirit of uh, what we learn here that's a, a, a good practice with right choosing the cases 
could bring a very good result and 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 and, and it's need uh, to do it uh, like that and uh, uh, that's what I have to uh, to hear but if somebody have more question I appreciate if they will edit uh, uh, somebody want to put maybe if you can open everybody to any question that's we have another nice. question uh, may I ask if the patient is on pacemaker will the ESW affect the pacemaker usually not well the, the, that's a very good question uh, as I said first the phone itself is not the pacemaker, but the synchronization. If you work with a synchronized mode, that's great because the patient will receive the shock wave synchronized with his heartbeat. That's way he'll be stable and there are no problems. The shock waves themselves do not damage the pacemaker. The only thing that you have to work is synchronized and it works very well. Now the benefit in patients with uh, pacemakers is that they usually have a very fixed and steady heart rate. So the patient is usually on 72. That's the classic heart rate for pacemakers. Okay, um, again, some of the pacemakers are not uh, constant and they're on-demand pacemakers. And this you have to consider with the cardiologist. Sometimes we disable the pacemaker, pacemaker for the uh, ESWL session and we work slowly with the synchronized mode. Uh, challenging case can be patient, but that's another issue with chronic atrial fibrillation, which is, we are, which is more difficult to synchronize, but that's a very really difficult issue, another issue. All in all, the answer is that pacemakers are not a problem. Sometimes there isn't a benefit. Thank you. Okay, so if you don't have any question, first of all, I want to, to Thank you everybody to participate in this uh, webinar and certainly to Professor Katz for the very informative and learning uh, issue. We appreciate your support in us and uh, thank you very much all of you. Thank you very much.